With year five, season three just around the corner, I thought it would be a good time for a quick catch up on what happened the last time we were in New York and where I predict the story could be taking us. Titled Vanguard, we will be uncovering the truth behind Keener's motivations in his final days. Following the events on Coney Island, where Keener had essentially set up the Black Tusk to be ambushed by the cleaners, and the division were able to move in and rescue Vitaly Trenenko, a distress call was received from the division command in Lower Manhattan. City Hall had been attacked. Agents from Washington make their way to New York. The attack left the building completely destroyed and contaminated by a new unknown virus. Through video surveillance, it is found that a group of rogues, led by Aaron Keener, were the ones responsible. For all those months, after abandoning the LMB in New York, Keener had been forcing Vitaly to create a new, weaponized version of the virus, called Eclipse. And with his new virus, his next step was to build a cell of rogue agents to help carry out his plan. First, Vivian Conley. With the offer of Vitaly Troninko's whereabouts on Coney Island, she and her cleaners were already well under the thumb of Keener. Next was James Dragoff. He would be brought on board along with his new family, the Rikers. Dragoff was completely uninterested in joining his cause, however he quickly changed his mind when Keener started executing Rikers and threatening to continue to take them down until Dragoff complied. Keener needed access to the supplies Dragoff was able to acquire and the ability to move them undetected through the city. Following this, Keener approached Theo Parnell, a master hacker and tech genius. He was able to persuade him by providing evidence backing up Theo's growing suspicions around his father's death and conveying to him that people higher up had shown not to have the best of intentions for the people and that the division was corrupt. Finally, there was Javier Kajika. Keener enticed Kajika to join him by offering up the names of the people that betrayed Kajika and his squad during a previous mission. So now he had his team. Their first job was to launch a collection of biological attacks on sites around New York City, and these included City Hall, a number of highly populated areas, and an assortment of JTF facilities. And it was this catalyst that led to the acting commander of the division in New York, Fei Lau, to request urgent help from the agents in Washington, D.C. Undeterred by the division's search for him, Keener continued with his preparations. With Parnell's technological expertise and Dragoff's uncanny ability to provide him with a number of high-tech materials, Keener's plan started to become a reality. The rogue agent network was built, along with more lethal forms of the SHD tech, and ground-to-air missiles that would aid in spreading the virus. With his plans now in full swing, Keener had very little need for his team of rogue agents anymore and allowed the division to take them down one by one. They had served their purpose. As a result from the intel gathered from the rogue watchers, Fei Lau was able to pinpoint Keener's location on Liberty Island. The agents quickly boarded a ferry and proceeded to Keener's location, but the Black Tusk were also looking for Keener and on the way to the island, launched a missile attack aimed at the boat and were successful in destroying it. However, the agents survived. The Black Tusk then sent ground forces to stop Keener, including a Razorback missile launcher, but the agents were quickly able to overwhelm their forces. Throwing in everything they had left, the Black Tusk sent in a Marauder-class quadcopter and a number of warhounds to kill Keener and any remaining agents on the island. But Keener's new, more advanced SHD tech was able to hack the quadcopter and warhounds and he turned them against the agents. The agents were successful in stopping the hacked forces, but now that all Black Tusk forces on the island had been eliminated, they had no choice but to abandon the attack, leaving Kina and the division agents to finish the fight. Fighting through Kina's heavy spam of SHD tech, the agents eventually cornered him on the outside of the island, where he was preparing to launch his missiles containing the new virus. With only seconds to spare, the agents were able to destroy the missile launcher. Kina then launched a head-on attack. However, it was during this attack that he was heavily wounded. He managed to escape to the pier, but his injuries proved too much. The division agents caught up to him, and before they could stop him, he activated his rogue agent network, telling the agents that they have no idea what is coming, before dying shortly after. We would find out later on that it wasn't so much that Theo had created a new rogue agent network called Anna, just that he had managed to learn of its existence and unlock access to it. As we now know, Anna was built at the same time as Isaac and is actually superior in many ways and would end up being Keener's gift to other agents who had lost faith in those who were calling the shots. 
The end of the Warlords of New York campaign left us with many questions, including Kena's huge personality shift, the fact that he has always been two steps ahead of everyone around him, yet he was easily tracked down to Liberty Island, and what was his purpose behind the missile attack that the agents were about to stop. Well, I'm hoping that Year 5 Season 3 will be able to answer a few of these questions, but there has been a lot of intel drops since Warlords of New York, so I'm going to throw out my prediction of where this season could be going. A lot of these thoughts I've touched on in earlier speculation, but with the new information over the last few months, I feel like I may have actually been a little closer than I thought. I'm just going to go out there and say it. All of my videos about Kena and the hashtag I've been posting over and over, Kena was right, I think this is how things will play out. It's not that I think we're the bad guys and that Kena was the good guy by any means, more that he was a sort of anti-villain, that his goals may have had some nobility behind them, but his methods of getting there may have been a little bit, well, maybe more than a little bit, evil. Regarding his personality shift, he started out shortly after the outbreak as highly intelligent, incredibly sure of himself with determination and perseverance. After turning rogue, his outlook changed as he believed that the rules and laws that used to govern them no longer existed, and that the only way to survive is by being the one in control. And as a consequence of this, he began to use his abilities in manipulation and influence to push others into achieving his goals. Audio logs in Washington DC showed that he had started to develop a bit of an ego, and later on in Lower Manhattan, a huge superiority complex was beginning to emerge, with an even greater thirst for power. So why the sudden change? I think this ties into the other question we've all been asking. Kena was always two steps ahead of the division and everyone else. Why would he so easily be tracked down and trapped on an island? With no backup plan other than to take on the division face to face, this really didn't fit in with everything else we'd seen from him up until this point. I think he needed to act in that certain way in order to recapture the division's attention. Up until this point the division had been investing a lot of their time and resources into finding Kena and maybe in order for them to finally see the big picture, he needed to eliminate himself from the scenario. With Kina gone, the true enemy would be revealed. We need to remember, at that time, we were aware of the Black Tusk, they had just invaded Washington DC, but we really didn't know much about them. Kina had always been fighting against the government, and any other organisation that mimics the government, like the Black Tusk. Sure, what is left of the division is a nuisance to Kina, but they have never been his main priority. In his eyes, they just hadn't yet seen the light. Maybe he knew that he would eventually have to make the ultimate sacrifice for the people to help the right individuals in the division on the correct path. Kena knew far more about what was happening in the background, I think more than we even know now, all these in-game months later, but in the upcoming season it will all be revealed. With Theo unlocking Anna, it's possible that a lot more was uncovered at that time. Through the Descent comms we've learned a lot about where Isaac has come from, as well as the interactions between Natalia and Kelvin long before the outbreak occurred. Through the system flaws around the foundation of Isaac's infrastructure, Theo was likely to have found this. But I don't think this is how Kena was able to find out about the betrayal happening deep within the government. He knew about this long before then. We've seen, or heard rather, that there are a number of agents that worked directly with Calvin McManus long before the outbreak. Kena was a first wave agent and could have been one of the first to be recruited. So maybe he had some sort of direct line to Cal and although he may not have been aware of the full story before everything went down, maybe after the JTF pulled out of the quarantine zone before going rogue, he would learn of what has been playing out in the background. Long story short, Kena could have known Kelvin personally, and because of this, probably Natalia too. He suspected something was up and kept digging, and then on top of this, Theo would uncover even more detail. Kena couldn't just turn to the agents and explain what he's found. He's a wanted man, they'd shoot him on sight, plus he was still putting the pieces together. And how would he know who to trust? And no, the irony of saying this about a rogue agent isn't lost on me. But look at the massive divide throughout the division ranks. And this has really only become obvious since his death. Being two steps ahead of us, he already knew the divide was there. And this is where I'm going to go a little bit off script here and suggest that maybe, there is a very small chance that maybe, Keita and Fei Lao had spoken not long before we took him out. All these months later, it does seem a little suspicious that she declared herself as rogue at that very moment. Perhaps there was more to it than just a super sweet way of ending a DLC, but that could be a story for another time. Let's talk about Kena's Eclipse virus for a second. Not just the virus itself, but also the missile we were able to stop at the end. I have no idea what was up with them deciding to blow up the city with this bomb. 
but it didn't really seem like a very big missile. Maybe he never really expected it to be launched, and it was more about getting the agents to his location. Or maybe he had a specific target in mind. The Black Tusk were after him as well. I know he pissed them off on Coney Island, but they were throwing a hell of a lot of resource into hunting down a single target. I don't know, I think there's more to this. However, if we look at his new and improved virus for a second, this really doesn't make sense to me and has been bugging me for a while. It was more deadly, it killed faster, almost immediately, and it was red. But it kind of seemed like a downscale of the dollar flu to me. Gordon Amherst's creation was so successful because 1. It had a 90% mortality rate, and 2. By the time an individual was showing symptoms, it had already spread to thousands of others, and through this, it was able to quickly and silently spread around the globe. Kena's eclipse virus makes a hell of a mess, killing almost everyone it touches, but other than leaving a heavily contaminated area in its wake, that's pretty much it. It doesn't even seem like a virus at this stage. I really wish that I had another week to work on this, but I wanted to get it out before the special report that is coming out in a couple of days. There are so many smaller details that have happened since the end of Warlords of New York that I really wasn't able to research properly and talk about here, so this is a lot more rushed than I would have liked it to be. But regardless, as a summary, I think Kina was onto something and was doing his own thing behind the scenes regarding Natalia Sokolova, President Ellis, and Calvin McManus. Realistically, one of two things happened at the end of Warlords of New York. One, he intended to be caught and killed for us to see the bigger picture. And two, probably the more likely one, but definitely not the way I hope it goes, his luck ran out and we were able to track him down before he was able to disappear once again. We finally killed the guy who'd been making us look silly since day one. Whichever way it goes, I still think he was working towards similar goals to us, albeit in his own twisted way. And through this season, we're going to hunt down and reap the benefits of his work. Anyway, I hope you found this interesting and you're as excited as I am to find out what happened with Aaron Keener. It's well overdue. Thanks for watching, and Extremis Mullis, Extrema Remedia.